it's interesting. So we'll just get the slides up. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I thought it was going to be like a walk down memory lane, going to Charing Cross, walking along the Strand, and going to the um, BCS building. When I got there, the man at the door knew nothing about Eva or, or the BCS. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had to make my way from there. Okay. Well, this was my lockdown project and uh, living in stratford upon avon uh, one cannot avoid being confronted by shakespeare at every corner pretty much everywhere in town and almost at every moment and the curious thing is that there's always some mystery about shakespeare whatever aspect you you take uh, a mystery emerges This project started when I visited about 12 months ago, I visited the home of local um, entrepreneur and property developer, Tony Bird, in his uh, amazing house in Billsley. And he, he took me for a tour around his, his art gallery. And he just in passing, he just mentioned this, um, this thing hanging on the wall. He said, have you seen this? The story behind this is that his father was, in the 1930s, was doing a clearance of a commercial property in Bridge Street, one of the major town uh, streets in Stratford. And his truck fell into the previously unknown cellar of the building. <laughs> he backed it in to take out the things from the ground floor and then the truck, the floor collapsed into a cellar that hadn't been known about before. And um, it turned out that it was packed completely full of objects related to Shakespeare, hundreds and hundreds of uh, art objects, some of them quite valuable. And this was one. And his father gave this to Tony and he's kept it all these years. So I, I was also able to uh, figure out what this store was. I managed to buy a little uh, post, uh, postcard size um, cardboard uh, town plan. And it shows. Um, Well, there we are. Just there in Bridge Street, um, place number 10 is, is rather highlighted. And that, that is the store that, um, where these things were stored. And previously, in Victorian times, up to about 1920, it had been the Shakespearean depot. So it was a, a large tourist shop, which was full of stuff related to Shakespeare, catering uh, especially for American uh, visitors. This is what it looks like. And I brought along a facsimile That's the actual size of the original. Uh, <coughs> the, the original one has a border around approximately two inches wide. It's a little less than, bigger than A3, it's smaller than A2 in the size. I'm going to just pass this around in the audience and take a look at it. Now, the curious thing is that this, this appears to be a rather crude drawing uh, based on the monument that's up on the wall 
above Shakespeare's grave in Holy Trinity Church. But as you look more closely at this, I have to zoom into it here, you see something interesting. See, it's, it's rather granular and there's something else going on. <laughs> and when I get close, you can see that the lines are actually made up of letters. So there's a continuous line of text running throughout this entire drawing which has been folded and turned and uh, tracing out the all of the, the contours and outlines of, of the drawing. Well, this is something curious. What, what is this object? What does the text say? Where did it come from? Are there any more in existence? You know, these were all the kinds of questions that were raised in my mind. And so I spent about four or five months on this as detective work and exploration of the object and then uh, programming to uh, to make a digital representation of this and uh, to finally to decode the text. When the print was dismounted, taken out of its um, frame and mount, this line was revealed right at the bottom. It had been covered up by the mount, so you couldn't see it originally. And it says, L. Gluck Rosenthal scripts it, and it gives his address. And I discovered from the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography that Louis Gluck was born in Prussia. He was fluent in a number of European languages, including Hebrew, and styled himself as a professor of languages, although he wasn't an academic. He emigrated in 1836 to Britain, took lodgings in the eastern end of London, and began to ingratiate himself with society um, by working as an artist in oils, watercolors, and his speciality of micro calligraphy. And there are some uh, three other known portraits by him, which are in um, collections in, in England. Uh, Queen Victoria, which are in the Royal Collection in the B&A. Uh, Duke of Sussex in the British Museum and John Wesley uh, in two different galleries. This is... Um, John Wesley, of course, and the central part is modeled on a, a previous uh, oil painting by someone else, but Kluke has added all of this um, decorative border around the sides. And it, again, every line in this is made up of lines of um, microscopic text. So what is Microcalligraphy. Well, it uh, can be defined as the art of writing in microscopic characters, and it's an ancient Jewish art form in which the design and layout of the letters creates a visual image which is somehow related to the meaning. And this uh, arose rather charmingly from the tension between prohibition and usage of images in Jewish uh, religious practice. The second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything. That forbade representations of God as a focus for worship and by extension uh, representations of, of uh, anything else related to, um, to the Bible. And yet the Jewish scribes found a way around this and from the ninth century, they began to uh, form their writing decoratively. And the justification was that the primary function was, was text. This was text that just happened to be rendered in, a, in an artistic way. You see the 
the um, drawing on the right is a, in the shape of a menorah. So this is a this became very elaborate over the centuries. Well, then I discovered that there's one more copy of the original Shakespeare print, and it's at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. And as far as I've been able to determine, uh, these are the only two prints in existence. I'm sure there must be more, but there's no record of, of them anyway. And the Folger Library doesn't have any provenance for its copy, and it doesn't have any um, translation of the text. I spoke to the curator there. Uh, she knew nothing more about it than the, the brief details in their database. And her opinion was that the task of transcribing the text from this drawing would be moderately Herculean. <laughs> And there's a thought that Herculaneity has, has a scale of, uh, of degrees. <laughs> so here's the question. Could the text be transcribed? When I started this, I didn't know whether this was something original that was written by Louis Gluck or whether it was copied from another work. So the objectives of my investigation were to transcribe the text by following these, this continuous sinuous line all the way around. Um, and also, if possible, to identify the sources. Well, it quickly became apparent that transcribing could not easily be done by direct reading from the print, from the actual um, lithographic print, because the original is too fragile for handling. And so we have to use a printed facsimile, something like this one. Uh, but the print area is close to A2, and it, therefore it takes some effort physically to turn it, and manipulate it, and get close enough to it with a magnifying glass to see uh, what's written there. Moreover, the lettering is very small. It's near the threshold of visual acuity. So you really need to do this under bright illumination and with a magnifying glass. And this continuous line of text winds endlessly around from beginning to end. It's some, and it's, the form is never the same twice. Sometimes it's in spirals or it's doubling back in a serpentine pattern or it crosses over its path. And in order to read it, you're continually having to turn the sheet around because of the complexity of this design, it's easy to lose your place when you look away. So if you're writing on a pad or typing on a keyboard, and then you come back to the thing, and you, it's difficult to relocate where you were. And moreover, the lettering is not uniform. It changes in size and slope from one place to another, and, and it's frequently distorted or faded and full of misspellings and almost no punctuation. So first step was to digitize this. So the dismounted print was scanned on my um, A3 scanner. I did it in two halves because it's bigger than A3, and then um, made a composite. And this gives a resolution of um, well, the, sorry, the scanner gave a resolution of 1200 dot per inch, which is equivalent to sampling the surface at 47 points per millimeter, which gives a pixel size of 21 microns. Now, um, those of you who were at EVA in 2010 may remember that I gave a presentation there called The Limits of Resolution, where I was trying to determine the, the how finely you should digitize something to capture all of the information that had been rendered by human hand. And it turned out that 1200 DPI is what you need to, to do that for all different kinds of artwork and different media. 
So this uh, very high resolution from the scanner gives a clear definition of the micrographic text. And it turns out that the type sizes are somewhere between five point and seven point in size. So the, the diameter of the letter O is typically about three quarters of a millimeter. So remember that the artist who was doing this was working with a, a pen or a stylus under a magnifying glass. And it's not surprising that he got a serious eye strain from doing it. So my first thought was, could I apply image processing to this problem? Suppose that I could develop an algorithm that would follow the curvature of the lines of text. Ideally, one could automatically locate the trajectory and then unfold or unwrap the, the line of text just so that it would be easier to transcribe. And perhaps I could then use character recognition to, to train an algorithm on, on the letter forms that Clue could use. So this is the kind of thing I was trying to do. Uh, here's a doing a look ahead along the, the text line. Each dot is the um, finding the centroid position of the, the line. So successive dots as it moves along and correctly um, identifies the, the corner, two corners, and goes a turns left and then left again and goes back the way it came. But in another part of the text, the same algorithm went wrong, that it uh, thought that the continuation at the top of the capital W in Warwick was up to the, the line above. I diddled around with this for a month or so and finally uh, gave it up because I, <laughs> I could have spent you know, years probably developing a better and better algorithm to navigate more and more of the text. But in the end, the purpose was to transcribe the, the print, not to develop an algorithm. And anyway, human ability to read the text is very much better than uh, machine ability. So suppose I could just do this directly off the screen. I could use a standard software viewer like Photoshop, but it's still not easy because the text is twisting around all the time and the image needs to be rotated quite often. And this is a big image of 649 megabytes, RGB image of about 20,000 pixels square. And it's uh, Photoshop uh, is, slow to rotate that, at least it's slower, slower than one would like to, to, to be interactive. The Folger library provides a viewer, we saw earlier, with some facilities for zoom and rotation, but it was still turned out not to be ideal. It wasn't easy to, um, to use. So in the end, I used MATLAB to develop a new software viewer that I could use as a tool for transcription. And it holds the complete high resolution image in a one memory buffer and then uh, maps the selected area into a display window on the screen. And uh, using part of, keeping part of the screen for a text editor for the transcription. I, I adopted two organizing principles to, to bring some structure to the text. Uh, I chunked it into numbered paragraphs of length up to 100 words, and uh, also recorded the coordinate points of the trajectory for each paragraph so that it was um, saved as a, a list of coordinate points. The, um, this is the main part of the view <coughs> that uses a standard trigonometric transformation. 
uh, just to give um, magnification and rotation from the, for the mapping onto the display window. The construction mode uh, chunks the text into paragraphs and uh, shows the starting point of each one by a numbered red uh, square. I used keyboard commands to make to manipulate the image to do the rotation and zoom and, and other display things. I also developed a way of uh, editing the trajectory coordinates points and um, using a blue overlay to show where they are. This, this blue line overlaying the text is very effective. And finally, I also developed a, a visualization mode where the full image is shown on the screen and uh, using a coarse seven by nine grid to um, locate features. Well, I'm pleased to say that at the end of all this, I was able to complete transcription. And altogether, there are about 9,000 words in this uh, script. It starts at the bottom left, where the, the pointy finger uh, indicates William Shakespeare. And it ends uh, up in the upper right. Uh, when the very last sentence is written uh, period of six days by Louis Group Rosenthal on the 1st of June 1849 in the 47th year of his age. So he created this in six days, six days. He had to select the text, he had to do the drawing, and then he had to do this micro calligraphy all around the line. So what's the source of this text? Where did it come from? Well, uh, wonderful thing about the internet is, especially resources like archive.org and Google Books, if you can um, scan millions of of texts and locate specific phrases. So I was able to, to identify three sources for, for the work. And the, the primary one is this book from published in 1846. This is the actual well, not the actual book that he used, but it's the edition that he used of um, uh, the biography by Charles Knight. There were umpteen editions of this produced over a 30 year period, but it was actually this one from 1846. And that, so that was published just three years before Gluck was making his drawing. So to conclude, my um, observations on this process, that it, it seems that the order added nothing of his own to this, except the final sentence. And this, to me, it seems like a missed opportunity, because he was presented himself as a humanitarian and man of letters, and he could have expressed his own opinions about Shakespeare. He could have actually done some research, some proper research, and embedded it in the text as a kind of a time capsule for posterity, for me to discover 170 years later. But he didn't. He just uh, cribbed it all from, from the standard book. But he, he was an artist, and he created an impressive object in doing this, and an impressive rendering of the Shakespeare monument. This is the drawing in uh, Knight's book that he was using. So he's taken that as the central element of the design. But he's added on the sides these two rather saucy muses. This was a great uh, tradition in the 18th century 
his engraving by the um, incomparable uh, Chodowski Pole oh, working in Berlin in the uh, 18th century, where the central figure of Shakespeare is uh, flanked by the, the Greek muses of comedy, Talia, and uh, tragedy. Uh, More likely, Gluck was influenced by the sculpture which in his time was on the facade of the Royal Institution in Pall Mall in London. This huge sculpture mounted up above the entrance to the British Museum, the British Institution, I should say, uh, which had formerly been Boydell's Shakespeare Art Gallery. This sculpture was removed to Stratford-upon-Avon in 1871, and you may now see it at the far end of the great garden of New Place. And I invite you to come to Stratford. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay. We're running a little late, but I think Lindsay's got some demonstrations we can do. So what I suggest, <coughs> sorry, anyone who wants to have a chat with Lindsay, do you want to do a demonstration over lunch? Yeah, sometime? yeah. So, I, have, I have the code running in MATLAB yeah. on my laptop. I'd be happy to um, show something about it. So I, I think anyone who wants to know a bit more about <coughs> some kind of demonstration over lunch, uh, because uh, yes, otherwise we won't have time for the uh, keynote speaker. So thank you, Liz.